seminar today from St. Jude West Penn uh, Low carbon district heating um, using centralised heat pumps. Um, before we sort of progress any further, can I just have a quick, quick sort of a show of hands? Um, did everyone get notification from HQ through an email to attend today? Just have a quick one. Excellent, excellent. So it's finally working then. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm saying it's, it's, it's sort of taken us by surprise with the, the number of people here, but we've been discussing it in, uh, uh, amongst ourselves as the committee as to, you know, has everybody had it recently? And, you know, up until this last one, some people were not getting it even on the committee. So it's, it's, it's obviously something's changed. So we need to investigate and make sure it happens again. Right, okay. But today uh, we have Dr. Andy Pearson from Star Refrigeration. He's going to talk about um, uh, uh, district heating schemes, uh, as, as I said, uh, specifically with a focus on a case study, I believe, where you've got some heat pumps installed. Um, this subject of district heating is quite, um, uh, it, it, it is a quite an upcoming thing here in the UK. Uh, we, those companies that like, like ourselves that are involved in this area, um, we feel we're just scratching the surface. We've got an awful long way to go to get it right. But the opportunities that district heating presents to provide, you know, heat and power and all that is just phenomenal. Um, countries like the Scandinavian countries, they're so far ahead of everybody else. But um, I'm not going to steal any more of uh, any thunder. If you wouldn't mind, Eddie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, great turnout. Well done. Um, so many people interested in heating. It must be November. So uh, there you go. Uh, the presentation falls into three sections. I'll give you a little bit of background, first of all. Why should we be bothered about low carbon at all? It's the first question. Why does district heating, in my opinion, form an absolutely key plank of that? And then why are heat pumps part of the district heating system? So that's the, the three starter questions. And then at the heart of our system it's ammonia as refrigerant. So I'll tell you a little bit about the use of ammonia and why it's so good, why, why we feel it's the way to approach this um, challenge. Um, and then give you an update on where are we now and then see there's a case study, I'll explain where it is, what it is and how it's getting on, how it's doing. So jumping straight in, I would say if there's anything that's not clear you want to ask, just ask. Um, it's informal enough that we can deal with that. Um, I've got nowhere else to go tonight. You might want to get home, but uh, do feel free to stop and ask. So, who knows what they were doing on September the 17th, 2012? Anyone remember? No? No takers? What we do know is what the Arctic was doing on September 17, 2012, because 2012 was the year in which the surface area of the Arctic ice cap was at its lowest uh, since records began, and the low point was September 17, 2012. Now, just to explain a little bit about this graph, this is a fascinating website, nsidc.org. Uh, you can waste hours, days, weeks of your life following NSIDC. It's really fascinating, the stuff they put up there. Uh, basically all about uh, the effect of climate on the, the polar ice caps, both Arctic and Antarctic. So the black line shows you the average value over the period 1980 to 2010. So that is a 30 year average. And the grey band around the black line shows you two standard deviations around that average. Now I gave a talk similar to this back in May and at that point, 2016, sorry, I need to go back up on. At that point, 2016 was the red line that you can see there was significantly below um, the 2012 record low level. It was looking as if the, the polar ice cap coverage was going to be even less this year than it had been in the record low 2012. Um, the question, the reason for showing you all this is because the basic background <coughs> question is, is something going on? Is there something happening? Or is this all just random fluctuations? So we're looking at a 35 year now period of records. If we take the area values 
from 1979 to 1988, so the first 10 years of that record, you can see that every single year it was above the average value um, within the two standard deviations and above the average value. And if we look at the most recent 10 years, you can see in every case it was below the average value. So the obvious question is, is something happening in the Arctic? Is something changing? Um, just to bring you up to date, on 2016, you can see the red line is now extended. I downloaded this graph on Sunday night, so it's as up to date as you're going to get. And you can see that we didn't reduce the ice cap to below the 2012 level. This is good news. But there's been a couple of delays in the re-establishing of the ice, one year and one year. So we are actually today at a level for this time of year that is lower than it has ever been in the history of recording this data in, in the Arctic. So the question is, is that indicative of something happening? That's just the basic question. Um, and my belief is that it is. If you were to plot back when I did this talk in June, the figures for May, this is May every year since 1979, and you can see that there's a, a steady decline. If you plot the same figures for October, you can see it's even more significant. And actually, October 2012, although we had the lowest ever in September, uh, 2007 was lower, and this year is much, much lower. Okay, it's a false zero, so it's giving you a, a wrong impression there. But whereas it was about 7.2 in 2012, it's about 6.5 um, in October this year. So there is less ice in the Arctic than there has been for a very, very long time. But that's only looking at the surface area. Because it's relatively easy to measure, there's loads of satellite data that will allow you to plot what the area of the ice is. Um, never mind the area of the ice, what about the thickness, what about the volume of ice that's there? So the two traces here, another fascinating website, Pyomass. You can waste the rest of your life if you're not looking at NSIDC by looking at Pyomass. Okay? Uh, the blue line is the trend for the maximum each year. Uh, just after the winter, uh, April is the time when the Arctic ice cap is at its largest extent. And this is the volume in um, thousands of cubic kilometers. Now I've really got no concept in my head of what a cubic kilometer looks like. Uh, big, I guess. Um, so you can see it drops from about um, 32,500 cubic kilometers in 1980. In April it's down about 25. Um, that's that's fairly serious, but it's still 25. Um, look at the end of summer, the September trend. Remember, September is the low point in that graph of area that I showed you previously. In 1979, there was 17,000 cubic kilometers volume of ice. Um, this year, it's down from 17 to about 7. In other words, it's about 30% of what was there when I was still at school. Um, so that's not that long ago, um, and this graph, a really serious point, is not a false zero. It's trending towards there being no ice in the Arctic in September in about, maybe over here somewhere, what would that be, 2025, 2030? Now this is much more difficult to measure than the surface area, but people do it by looking at, at the satellite image from above, by taking ground surveys on the ground, and with submarines measuring from below. Um, and I remember a, hearing a US Navy submarine captain saying that the first time he went under the North Pole was in 1970. And uh, the last time he did it, which was about five years ago, um, there was only about 15% of the thickness of ice at the North Pole that there had been when he traversed it at the same time of year in 1970. So this, this is a kind of overall <coughs> generic view it's much more patchy than that. So, I firmly believe that there is something happening up in the Arctic. So why is this important? Well, we'll do a little bit of show of hands. How many people would put themselves towards the red end of these arrows, saying there is either definitely not, or probably not, a causal link between carbon emissions and climate change um, as the thing that is driving this reduction in the volume of ice in the Arctic? So who's in the definitely not, probably not camp? Anybody willing to wave a hand at me? Go on, you know you want to. <laughs> How about people right at the, the green end of the arrow?
probably or definitely? Who thinks there's a probably or definitely? Okay, you are in good company. And this is a survey of surveys uh, which looks at what climate and earth scientists think about the connection between human activity, i.e. carbon emissions, and global warming. And you can see of all these studies along the bottom, um, the percentage of the scientists who thought there was red end of the scale, probably or definitely not, versus the other end, and 84%, 98%, 90%, the vast, vast majority of the people who do this for a living think that there is a causal link <coughs> between human activity and global warming. So anyone know who this guy is? Myron Ebo. Anyone heard of Myron Ebo? No, this, is, this is the topical bit of the talk. I robbed most of it from the one I did in June, but this is the new bit. When I first heard of him, I thought it was this person that was being talked about, <laughs> Dr. Ebo. But it's not him, it's Myron Ebo. Myron Ebo has just been appointed by Donald Trump to oversee the transition of the EPA from the current um, I was going to say regime, but that's not the right word. Uh, administration, that's the word. From the Obama administration to the Trump administration. So what does Myron Ebo think about climate science? Well, this is a fair comment. Um, if science is going to be discussed in the public arena, shouldn't people other than scientists be allowed to participate? Who agrees with that? That yeah, seems a fair comment to me. Um, isn't that what a representative democracy is? Fair enough, Myron, good point. Myron has a BA from San Diego University in philosophy, followed up with an MSc in political science from the London School of Economics, and he then did some postgrad stuff uh, at Cambridge in history, but I don't think he was awarded a degree, so he's not Dr. Ebel, he's just Mr. Ebel. Okay, so what else has he said? There has been a little bit of warming, well done Myron, well spotted. Um, but it's been very modest and it's well within the range for natural variability. Uh, I don't think so. Um, whether it's caused by human beings or not, it's nothing to worry about. This is the guy who's about to take over the United States Environmental Protection Agency under Donald Trump. So, why is this important? Head of Donald Trump's EPA transition team. The reason it's important is because of what's happening with global <coughs> population. And you can tell by now, I'm a bit of a numbers geek. I like my numbers. Um, when I was at school, I used to think population of the world is about 6 billion people, and it was, it was round about that. When I was born, it was only 3 billion people, so in my lifetime, the population of the world had doubled. Um, I'm not responsible for all of that, only for three of them. <laughs> um, by 2011, it passed 7 billion, um, 7 billion people in the world, and where are we now? Well, two things to point out. We're at about 7.3 billion people in the world, and 53% of those people live in conurbations, either in towns or cities or megacities. Um, if you scroll forward and you take the average value, the, the middle of the range, by 2050, we will have a world population of about 9.5 billion people. So it will increase from 7 to 9.5. But it's predicted that two-thirds of them <coughs> will live in cities. Now, once again, this is a false zero on this graph, but it's not that false. So you can see that the number of people that are living in cities um, is going to almost double between now and 2050. Now, there are lots of things that should immediately be jumping into your minds about where are they going to live, how are we going to accommodate double the population of cities, is every city in the world going to double in size? That is not practical. Are we going to be building new cities? And if so, what are these new cities going to look like? How are they going to be fueled? What are these people going to do for a living? What are they going to do for entertainment? What are they going to do for food? There are massive, massive challenges behind these statistics. And at the same time, we're talking by 2050 that we're going to reduce our carbon emissions from current 2010 levels to what are people saying, 10%, 20% of the current levels by 2050? Depends on which, which country you're looking at. But we're expecting to double the number of people that live in cities, but reduce the carbon emissions by a factor of at least five, if not 10. So there's a huge, huge challenge to be overcome, not just to deal with the carbon emissions, but to deal with the combination of carbon emissions and population growth. 
So let's think about what that living in cities means from a UK perspective and the use of energy in the UK. These are stats from DEC, um, sadly no longer with us. I liked DEC, they did some good stuff. Um, they had good people working there, but they've been kind of swallowed up by BIS. Um, so they're kind of still there, but less visible. So this is from their UK energy and brief statistics. 1980 and 2014, how we use it energy. Um, so you've got oil, gas, coal, nuclear, and then since 1980, bioenergy and waste has been introduced. And we're actually doing a good thing. The population in the UK has increased very slightly in this time, but we're actually using less energy than we did in 1980, so that's an energy efficiency kind of a thing. But if we were to split out um, gas and coal and look at what's used for heating versus what's used for other purposes, um, and a tiny amount of oil is used for heating as well, we can start to play around with the numbers, split out the fuel used to generate electricity, remove the oil that's used for transport, and compare the stuff that's used for electricity and the stuff that's used for the, the rest, the rest is primarily heating. So you can see roughly double, very roughly double the fuel that we use is used for heating compared to used for generating electricity. So about 30.5% is used for heating and 18% of the primary energy is used for generating electricity. And some of the electricity is used for heating as well, so the heating figure is actually even higher than 30.5. If you think for a moment about my day job of cooling, because that's generally what we do, um, about one-ninth of the electricity generated in the UK is used for running some form of refrigeration system. Um, and these systems typically would have a COP of about two on average, some much better, some much worse. So think about the amount of kilowatt hours per year used for cooling stuff, that's the blue bar, versus the amount of kilowatt hours per year used for heating stuff. The market for heating is about nine times bigger than the market for cooling. There's a huge focus on designing and engineering cooling systems. I don't see the same focus on designing and engineering heat pump heating systems yet. Um, so here's a quote from a guy, David Mackay, sadly died, I think, last year, but wrote this fantastic book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Anybody read it? Available free as a download. If you just search Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, you can download it. For number geeks like me, it's fantastic, full of numbers, lots of really, really interesting stuff. One of the things that David Mackay said was setting fire to chemicals like gas should be made a thermodynamic crime. He was talking about the way governments try to incentivize people by giving um, money to do this, money to do that. It's a very poor way of incentivizing. Make it a thermodynamic crime. If people want heat, they should be forced to get it from heat pumps. That would be a sensible piece of legislation. So I agree with David, right on brother, absolutely. <laughs> There's this fascinating app that you can download that shows you the carbon intensity of electrical generation. I think it was Southampton University that produced it originally. And here's what I did back in May, this was actually 13th of June, just before the, the previous presentation. Carbon intensity for the UK was 341 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So we did it again on Sunday, um, 355, not that much different. Um, the reason it's stabilized is we're using much, much less coal than we did before. We're seeing uh, wind and hydro beginning to come in a little bit. Just on Sunday night, wind was about 10% of the total generation. Gas was still right up there at 47%. So we've kind of honed in and we're locked in on the carbon intensity will be roughly the carbon intensity of using gas to generate the electricity, plus or minus, depending on the balance going on. Um, and you can see the mix through the day by the different types as they variously load and unload. So, if we're going to manage to cope with the big growth in population in cities, and we're going to manage to, to capture climate change, and I'm not necessarily, I'm not making a judgment call on whether melting the polar ice cap is a good thing or a bad thing, I'm only using that to demonstrate that something is definitely happening, and it's very probably happening because of what uh, mankind has been doing. So, to achieve a result in terms of carbon emissions, it seems to me that we have to do two things and we have to do them simultaneously. We have to reduce that 355 grams per kilowatt hour figure, reduce carbon emission from generation. But at the same time, we have to move more of that 30.5% of energy use in the UK onto the electrical grid. 
And that seems to me counterintuitive. You think if you want to reduce carbon emissions, carbon emissions come from power stations, from electricity, you want to get as much stuff off the grid as possible. But if we've cleaned up the grid, then that's the best place to get our heating from. So if we achieve both of these together, we can hopefully limit CO2 emissions to 450 parts per million in the atmosphere, keep the climate rise to the two degrees that the Paris Accord was aiming for, save the planet, fantastic. If we only achieve one of these, what happens? If we manage to green the grids, but we don't manage to get people using electricity for heating, then carbon emissions will be at best stay the same um, because we're still burning stuff to do heating. Um, we'll still burn fossil fuels in other heating appliances. If on the other hand, we don't manage to green the grid, but we do transfer heating onto the grid, then carbon emissions will at best stay the same because we do more electric heating, but it's just as emissive as if we were burning the stuff directly. So we have to multitask. Bad news for all the guys in the room. We've got to do two things at once. Never easy. If we don't do either of them, which is business as usual, then we don't reduce the carbon emissions and we don't shift stuff onto the grid, then we're really screwed. So, a graphic that I, I, I nicked from um, the IET uh, Power Academy, some useful documents here. This is looking at the carbon intensity of electricity over time. In 1990, it was way up about 800 grams. You saw from the app, it was 355 at the moment. It's gradually been reducing. We've seen more um, uh, low carbon forms of energy coming in of all types, nuclear, hydro, wind, solar, so it's gradually increasing, but to get to 2050, to get to where we need to be, we've got to see a massive uh, upturn in that quite suddenly. At the same time, if we look at gas, uh, the carbon intensity of electricity from gas was about 40% um, in 1990. It doesn't really shift on the x-axis. It's always going to be around about the um, 250 to 300 grams per uh, a kilowatt hour. If you look at oil, it's a bit dirtier, but it's been reducing much more, so we're using less of it. Um, so, one possible future, one, one way to achieve both axes of that um, previous graph that showed the multitasking would be to do our heating electrically, including using heat pumps, and I'll explain why in a moment. We will need to use some gas to do that, so we can't eliminate <coughs> carbon emissions completely, but we can massively reduce the amount of emissions by transitioning onto the grid. Now, this is a huge challenge because it's already, um, we get the impression it's creaking at the seams a bit. You know, it's, it's um, not necessarily completely maxed out, but in certain parts of the country, it's, it's fairly well stressed. So, how do we go about putting a lot more electricity onto the existing grid. That's a huge challenge to go along with all these other challenges. So that's given you the kind of the background, the reason why I believe this is important. We're going to play a little game now called Everybody Knows. And I want you to put your hand up if you've heard the little fact that I'm going to give you. There are three of them. So just put your hand up when you recognize one of them and keep it up as we go through, okay? I'm not saying, do you believe that it's true? I'm just saying, have you heard? Everybody knows. So the first one, everybody knows that John F. Kennedy went to Berlin in 1963 and said to the Germans, I am a jam donut. Who's heard this story? Nobody heard the story? Yep, one at the back, okay? So, um, we'll come back to that. Everybody knows that Humphrey Bogart says, play it again, Sam, in Casablanca. Who's heard that? Yeah, that's Woody Allen to blame for that, but we'll come back to that as well. And everybody knows that WD and WD-40 stands for War Department. Who's heard that one? Yeah, a few. Okay, so, here we go. John F. Kennedy, did he say, I am a jam donut in 1963? No, he said in his speech in Berlin, Ich bin ein Berliner, and a Berliner is a jam donut. And the pedant said, because he'd said, Ich bin ein Berliner, I am a Berliner, he was saying to the locals, I am a jam donut. And this was, it, nobody actually apparently thought that at the time, but it's something that was picked up about five years later, and it kind of circulated. It became whatever memes were before they were memes, you know, that, that JFK said, I am a jam donut. He said, Ich bin ein Berliner. I could say, I am Glaswegian, 
I could say I am a Glaswegian. The point is he was saying he should be an Ein Berliner because he was wanting to identify himself with the people of Berlin who were behind the, the Berlin Wall and they were in this little enclave 150 miles from the, the east-west <coughs> border and feeling really hemmed in. So um, he was not wrong, his, his German grammar was faultless, his pronunciation was a bit dodgy but his grammar was faultless. Humphrey Bogart in the film he says to Sam the pianist, he says you played it for her, you can play it for me. If she can stand it, I can play it. He never in the film at any point says, play it again, Sam. So, raspberries for that one as well. Play it again, Sam was the, the title of a Woody Allen film in 1971, which is a kind of spoof of Casablanca. So that's why everybody got it in their head. And WD, um, WD-40 was actually developed in 1955, so it wasn't the miracle secret weapon that the Americans produced to single-handedly win World War II, as they call it. Um, the guy, Norm Larson, who worked for the Rocket Chemical Company in San Diego, um, was looking for a water disbursement um, so that he could spray it on the rocket components that they were making for the Southern Californian Space Program. And WD-40 was his 40th attempt to produce a water dispersant. Um, so in his lab book he wrote WD-40 as this, the secret code name um, for this chemical. And it was so successful that within three years the Rocket Chemical Company had changed its name to the WD-40 company because they didn't sell anything else by then because everybody wanted it. Um, so the joke about that is that uh, Norm Larson's name WD-40 stuck unlike everything that he sprayed it on. So there you go. So a little bit more of everybody knows. Facts about heat pumps. Heat pumps can only do small to medium sized duties. Hands up if you've heard that one expressed by anybody. Okay. Um, keep hands up as you recognize them. Heat pumps need to be air source or else they need to have very, very expensive groundworks, earthworks. Yeah. Heat pumps can only deliver water at 60 degrees C or less. Yeah, there's a few recognitions there. Heat pumps are no good for retrofit projects. Anybody heard that? Yeah, okay, good. Heat pumps are unreliable. Yeah, mm. Heat pumps are inefficient. Heat pumps don't pay back. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So, I've got a case study to show you um, that will explain why I think that these everybody knows facts about heat pumps are wrong. But before we get to that, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the different types of heat pumps. So they can be broken into air source or water source. Here's an air source heat pump that we built earlier this year. This concept, the heat pumps need to be small. This is an air source heat pump that delivers 450 kilowatts of heat and it's being installed in a housing scheme in Glasgow to deliver heat to uh, residential flats, social housing, uh, council houses basically. So 450 kilowatt air source heat pump. Um, water source can be divided into what I call river source, although it's not necessarily river, and ground source. And ground source, you think that's the one where you have to do the expensive earthworks. Well, here's a building being built. They're doing the expensive earthworks anyway. Why not bury your heat loops in the foundations? Why are you building the building? Wouldn't cost you a penny more than the project was already going to cost, and you would have an excellent um, a heat mesh for providing ground source heat pumps. So it doesn't have to be an expensive add-on. River source I would divide into um, natural and process. Uh, natural, here's a nice river bank. You'll see more of this later. Um, you can pump water out the river, cool it down by two or three degrees, put it back in the river, and that can be your heat source. And it's actually a very, very cheap way of extracting heat from the atmosphere without going to the difficulty of air source or a sewage farm. Uh, sewage farm outlet water is warmer than the river and it's cleaner than the river and it's presented to you on a plate. So why would you not use a sewage farm as a heat source for a large industrial heat pump? It makes perfect sense, but very, very few people do it. You think, mm, dirty, dirty, dirty sewage farm. It's not it's cleaner than the river. <coughs> you might think that doesn't say much about the rivers in Glasgow, but it's the, the output of the process that I'm talking about. So we can also characterize them by air source, <coughs> easy to get the heat out of the air. You saw the big box that I showed you, the 450 kilowatt, it's just got fans on the top and air blows through it, that's all you have to do, it's dead easy. Process source, as I said, is given to you on a plate, the water's being pumped anyway, all you need to do is put a heat exchanger into the water line and you've got your heat source. So they're, they're the easy ones. Ground source and natural source, you have to think a bit more about it, it is a bit harder. 
so we can characterize them that way. Or we can slice and dice it differently and look at smaller ones. Air source would tend to be smaller. Ground source would tend to be smaller just because of the size of the heat network required. Process source and natural source tend to be the, the industrial sized ones. So there are lots of different ways we can look at them. Um, the small ones tend to be individual <laughs> units, very often factory built units. There are loads of them about domestics from um, all of the major manufacturers really. The larger ones tend to be customized individual design um, used for uh, district loops providing heat to lots of users rather than one heat pump per user as with the individual units. So we've got the, the little domestic units, we've got the medium sized um, uh, air source unit and we've got the big industrial and this is the case study I'm going to go on to talk about. Um, this is 13,000 kilowatts of heat and it's delivering the hot water to the district loop at 90 degrees C so all of these everybody knows about heat pumps actually that's not quite how it goes and this is where the ammonia comes back in. I mentioned ammonia at the beginning. Ammonia is a bit like standing around the wrong end of a cow. Um, it's kind of smelly, unpleasant, um, but it's a very, very common industrial chemical. It's um, produced to the tune of about 160 million tons a year, most of which is used in agriculture and is, is just injected into the farm fields. Um, and about 1% of that production is used for refrigeration applications. So here's a typical ammonia refrigeration plant room, all um, fairly standard stuff. Lots of advantages to using ammonia as a refrigerant. Um, it's efficient, it's cheap, it's reliable, um, it's very widely available, it's easy to get hold of the ammonia for the refrigeration system. It costs about um, a pound a kilo, something like that. If you go and buy a, a HFC refrigerant, you're probably paying five times that if it's just a straightforward R134A, 25 times that if it's a, a more complicated blend chemical. And ammonia refrigeration is actually very easy. It's very reliable. Um, it's easy from a maintenance point of view. So lots of things going for it. Um, it has some disadvantages. Um, you need to have skilled staff to work with it because there are safety implications. It's both flammable and toxic. And provided you recognize these things and deal with them, that's okay. But if you don't, you'll be in trouble. There is fairly significant amount of legislation surrounding its use. But then on the other hand, there is for all the HFCs now, anybody who was paying attention to the, the meeting in Kigali, Rwanda, just a few weeks ago, would see the HFCs are actually now on the phase out list as well as CFCs and HCFCs. So the revolving door has turned a little bit further. And Ammonia has this image that it's, it's old fashioned, you know, that's, that's the way my grandfather did refrigeration, that's not really what we want nowadays. So a few pictures of alternative uses for Ammonia just to, to um, address the old fashioned image. This is the X-15, it was developed by NASA before the space program to test out all of their theories about um, out of atmosphere flight. It held both the uh, speed record at Mach 4.6 and the altitude record at 62.5 <coughs> miles, 100,000 kilometers um, for about 25 years and was powered by ammonia as the fuel. Um, this is the International Space Station. NASA looked at 12,000 different possible refrigerants and they picked ammonia as the refrigerant for the cooling system on the International Space Station. Now, the one thing I don't understand is in the European Standard EN378 on refrigeration safety, it says that the plant room needs to have emergency exit doors that open outwards. And this doesn't seem like a very good idea on the International Space Station. Um, but they didn't do it that way. And this is a, an Italian sports car, supercar built by Marangoni, the tyre company, to, to demonstrate alternative um, fuels for vehicles, like the X-15 powered by ammonia. So it's used for all sorts of interesting and different things. Um, why is it worth it for heat pumps? Is this thing called the critical temperature of a fluid. It's the temperature where it no longer exists as both gas and liquid. Um, and you can see the critical temperatures for lots of different refrigerants along the bottom there. Um, 
The highest one, the third bar and the red one, is butane. Butane's fantastic, um, 150 degree critical temperature, but unfortunately not really suitable for industrial systems like this. The second highest, right on the left hand side, is ammonia, um, 133 degrees C, critical temperature. So if you're looking to heat things up and you want to stay away from the critical point, because the key thing is the closer you get to the critical point, the less efficient your system becomes. Ammonia has a far better chance of being efficient than the other fluids like R134A, 410A, 404A because it has a higher critical temperature. So it's just a physical fact, it is particularly well suited to use as a refrigerant in a heat pump. The other thing I'd ask you to note about this, is if you compare ammonia with the blue columns, the blue columns with what I would call the old refrigerants, R12, R22, the purple columns are the replacements for them, the HFCs, R134A, 404A and that kind of thing. As we move from the blue to the purple, notice that the critical point is getting lower. The replacement chemicals as refrigerants have been a compromise, and one of the things that has been compromised as a trade-off against having a lower global warming potential or a lower ozone depleting potential is they also have a lower critical temperature, and therefore these new fluids are less suited to use in heat pumps than R12 and R22 were. <coughs> Ammonia, having been around for 150 years as a refrigerant, um, isn't going anywhere fast. And that translates into an operating range. We use ammonia in freezers down to about minus 50 degrees. We're also using it in heat pumps up to 90 degrees. It's got this incredibly wide operating range from a temperature point of view. So really, why is it worth it? Because it, it is so good, basically. Um, however, using it as a heat pump fluid is undoubtedly a challenge. This graph shows the relationship between pressure and temperature. Every fluid has a pressure temperature relationship. Uh, water, for example, if the pressure is one bar, then it will evaporate at 100 degrees C. If you raise the pressure to five bar, it will evaporate at 150 degrees C. If you drop the pressure to 0 0.01 bar, then it will evaporate at freezing point. That becomes its um, um, triple point. With ammonia, the blue band shows you the typical operating range that we're working in for refrigeration systems between the evaporator and the condenser. And the red band shows you where we have to operate if we want to do heat pumps. So in order to get the higher temperatures, we're having to operate at higher pressures. And that brings a whole bunch of challenges um, in designing the system. So what did we learn from, from doing these systems? Uh, there was a, a challenge with oil solubility. Um, it's another everybody knows. Everybody knows that ammonia is insoluble in oil, except that when you go to these high temperatures and pressures, we find solubility of about 4%. This is an aluminium balance piston from inside one of the screw compressors. And what's actually been happening here is that the ammonia has been absorbed in the oil, and there's been a vibration between two very close surfaces, which has caused cavitation on the surface of the aluminium. It's knocked the protective oxide layer off, and we've got this heavy corrosion underneath because of this oil solubility problem. So we've had to look at alternative materials for some of the components in the compressor. Um, this is the um, uh, resin seal on the bottom of uh, an oil filter, um, which with the high pressure and temperature has failed to stand up to the, the operating conditions. So we've had to look at alternate materials for them. And this is a metal-to-metal -metal surface from within the compressor, where again, this oil solubility and cavitation has caused problems on the steel as well as on the aluminium. And finally, an O-ring, um, also available in a round cross-section as this one originally was, but it's been so highly pressurized and squeezed that it's actually been extruding. This is a thin ribbon of O-ring material which has been squeezed between the two flanges because the, the temperature and pressure were so high. So high pressure and temperature give us excessive forces we found that because some of the bolts in the compressor had not been really carefully torqued, they'd actually been um, slightly under torqued, and therefore they were, they were uh, experiencing a high cyclic force, and we had a fatigue failure of the, the bolts, which happened to be one of the five bolts that were holding the thrust collar on the end of the shaft of the screw compressor. And when the first one broke, then the second, third, fourth, and fifth broke, this is the end of the shaft. You can see the thrust bearing, uh, rolling element bearing there. If you look really carefully, you can see the five ends, the other ends of, of these five bolts. So what happens to a screw compressor when you don't have 
um, a thrust bearing anymore. Well, here's a before picture. You can see all of this is a gate rotor with all the, the teeth which mesh with the main rotor to provide the compression of the ammonia. This is before and this is after. No teeth anymore. So um, that's all what comes from running at these high pressures and uh, having to deal with the excessive forces. Also other, other components highly stressed. Uh, we were using stand, this is a push rod that moves the slide valves and the compressor um, before and after, fractured because of the high forces, so we're using a, a, a strengthened a push rod. Um, this is a tube from one of the shell and tube condensers, it's a finned tube, and there was a defect in the material, so the, the tube was faulty. If we'd been running at normal operating conditions, we would probably never have known this, but because we're running at 90 degrees C condensing, which is about um, 65 bar, uh, the defects weakened the tube to the extent that it leaked. And there's a cross section of the tube. You can see that the crack has propagated all the way through from the, the initial flaw at the surface. Also high noise and vibration. The vibration also caused some components to break. We fitted um, HIDAC style dampers to the hydraulic circuit to reduce the vibration. This was a great result, uh, very positive, but the, the rubber of the bellows of the damper wasn't compatible with the ammonia, so we had to think again. Uh, we then fitted um, what's called a Helmholtz resonator. This is really neat. This is like the F holes in a violin which caused the sound to resonate. Uh, this little pot is sized to be just the right volume versus the diameter of the neck that it responds to the specific frequency and it creates a negative sound wave that cancels out the positive sound wave that's coming along the pipe and by doing this before we did this we had a noise level coming off the compressor which was way higher than it should have been it was about 125 decibels at one meter from the compressor and by adding the Helmholtz resonator we reduced that to um, 100 98.99, so re reduced by over 25 decibels the noise level coming off the compressor. So again, fantastic learning process, but it was a bit painful getting there. So the lessons we learned, we need stronger materials and components. The oil doesn't behave the same way when it's a high pressure. We need a different seal materials, different resins in the, in the oil separator. The gas pulsations are much more severe than they would be. Liquid pulsation is also more severe. Um, the reason we had the tube failure is because our subcontractor who manufactured the heat exchanger had not followed a robust enough quality procedure, so he had used this dubious material. In his defense, he had three of these to build, and he could only get sufficient tubes from his normal supplier for two of them, so he'd gone to a different supplier in order to meet the program. So he was under time pressure, and he uh, stepped outside of his procedures, which caused a massive problem. Um, so include the suppliers um, and also dealing with all this vibration meant we needed to look really, really carefully at the mounting foundations for the heat pump. So that's all lessons that we have taken on board and learned <coughs> and what we now do reflects the fact that we've had these issues and we've, we've taken them and engineered our way through them to a successful solution. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm a Glaswegian. Um, Glasgow is a city that's struggling to come to terms with its post-industrial existence. It used to be the workshop of the world. Um, I read somewhere that 25% of all railway locomotives in the world were produced in Glasgow in 1900 and they went everywhere. Um, it's not like that any longer, but it's kind of reinventing itself as a, as a trendy media city type place. Um, new pedestrian walkways across the Clyde. BBC, um, ITV, television studios just on the banks of the river, uh, very fancy. Um, and it's got a world famous brewery at Well Park where tenants uh, brew their um, uh, various beverages. Uh, those photos actually aren't of Glasgow, they're of a town in Norway called Drammen which shares a very similar history to Glasgow, but it's the home of this um, district heating heat pump case study, um, supplied by Star in 2010, commissioned in 2011. Um, and it's interesting that the two cities have that kind of common heritage because um, I've certainly enjoyed going over to Norway and getting to know the people there and, and um, sharing experiences with them. Um, but there is another link back to Glasgow. This is a photograph of Glasgow University and the River Kelvin. Now, presumably everybody's heard 
of Lord Kelvin. Um, various things named after him. Um, the Jewel, Jewel Thompson effect is named after him, believe it or not, because his name was originally William Thompson, and he became Lord Kelvin in about 1890. He took his name from the river, so the river is the source of the name Kelvin. Um, and the reason he appears in this story, this is everybody knows, this is what Lord Kelvin looks like. He's kind of refugee from ZZ Top, um, just yeah. crusty old fuddy-duddy, you know. Um, when he was still just plain William Thompson, he wrote a paper in 1852 on the economy of the heating or cooling of buildings by means of currents of air. And in this paper, he proposed the totally radical thought that the quantity of heat that you could put into a building might be greater than the quantity of energy that you used to transfer that heat into the building. Um, really, really interesting paper. He says here, if an engine be employed to pump air for heating and ventilating a building, as is done in Queen's College, Belfast, all the waste heat of the engine along with the heat of the fire not used may be applied by means of suitable arrangements to warm the entering current of air. So you can actually transfer more heat into the building than um, you, you burned if you take the engine and you use it to transfer ambient heat as well. So fantastic idea. And he didn't look like the crusty old fuddy-duddy when he wrote the paper. It's more a kind of um, Lord Byron tribute band, I think, is going on here. So this is William Thompson um, eventually to become Lord Kelvin. And the Draman project is on the banks of a river as well, the Draman Selva. It's about 45 kilometers southwest of Oslo. Um, the river flows from the west here and it flows out into the fjord and this is the energy center for the district heating system and this is the river on the left hand side of the photograph. Um, the band in the center is a screenshot from our site SCADA system so you can see we're delivering 13.142 megawatts of heat, we're achieving a COP of 3.075 to do that. That was a kind of summertime condition. Uh, they're very smart, the Norwegians. They know how to get the best out of everything. Um, they described it as the most efficient district heating system in Norway. In winter time, what's interesting is that they, they tweak the conditions. They push the water flow rate up enormously because they're now having to do additional heating. Still achieving 13 megawatts of heating, but this thing that heat pumps get less efficient in the winter time. Here's the winter time condition and the COP is 10% higher than it was in the summertime condition because of the way that they're operating the plant. So um, basically lots of clever tricks that you can play to get around the, the traditional challenges. Um, how are we doing? I need to kind of move on. Um, this is a schematic of the ammonia circuit. The heat pump has got two compressors. It's got an intercooler between condenser, d or subcooler at the top. So we're heating up the water by running it through the condensing side of the system and at the same time we're taking river water at 8 degrees putting it through the evaporator and chilling it down to 4 degrees. Now the fascinating thing about Draman is that the river water temperature is 8 degrees every month of the year except one. Anyone want to guess which month it's not 8 degrees? December. April. It's, it's not 8 degrees in April, it's 6 degrees because all the snow is melting and the meltwater runs down into the river, drops the average temperature by 2 degrees. But it's very predictable and it's very steady, very flat 8 degrees, then it dips and then it comes back up again. So the system designed for 8 degrees, but in April when it's 6 degrees, we can increase the throughput through the chiller and still maintain the 4 degree outlet, taking as much heat out the river. On the water side, it's a lot more complicated. Basically, we're pulling lots of dodges to get the heat up to 90. So we're achieving heat at 90, despite the fact that we're condensing the ammonia at 88 degrees. And we get the extra final 2 degree top up with 95 degree heat from the oil coolers and heat from the D superheaters. Um, there's also a bit that's not shown here is we use water-cooled electric motors. And the inefficiency of the electric motor also eventually ends up in the district heating loop. So even the energy that we would have lost into the air is scavenged and recovered and put back into the system. And this gives us a flow at 90 and a return at 60 degrees. So a schematic of what it looks like. Um, photograph, these are the electric motors. The low stage machine is a 1200 kilowatt motor. The high stage machine has a 600 kilowatt motor. So we've got 5400 kilowatts of electric motor in the room. 
they're not normally running anything like fully loaded, um, but they're this weird looking shape because there's a heat exchanger in there, so they're effectively water cooled. A full view of the SCADA, you can see all three systems running. The first is heating the water to about 70 degrees, the second one to about 80 degrees, and the third to about 90 degrees. So they heat the water in series because that's a slightly more efficient way of doing things. And another shot here again, in this case 13.4 megawatts, a COP of 3.068. So what did we achieve? Well, we've got a 13 megawatt heat pump. It's been in and running since January 2011. Various bumps along the road, as I showed you, it's been a very, very difficult <coughs> project to deliver. But uh, we now have a very happy customer who is delivering over 75% of the total heat to the town from the heat pump. And what you need to know about the Norwegian model is that if he runs the heat pump, he sells the heat at three times the operating cost, so he makes a whacking profit. If he uses electric heat, he sells the heat for the, the operating cost, so he makes zero profit. But if he uses his uh, gas boiler or oil, bo oil boiler, um, he can only sell the heat at the same price because it's regulated, but the running cost is three times higher than the selling price. So he has to run the gas boiler to meet his obligation to deliver heat, but he loses money every time the gas boiler is on. So he has to maximize the availability of the heat pump. Um, Basically, from mid-October until mid-April, it runs pretty much 24-7. Um, occasionally, they go back off slightly in the middle of the night if it's a fairly mild night, but you don't get too many mild nights in winter in Norway. And uh, it, runs, it runs all the way through. Um, we do all the heavy maintenance in the summer when they still have a demand for heating. Um, for example, about uh, five megawatts maximum load on the, on the circuit is uh, a local hospital and they have a fairly high heat demand even in the summer. So there's always one of the systems running. In the winter time all three will be running. In the summer time we can take one offline to do maintenance and still have one run, one standby. Um, and to date, this figure is actually a bit out of date, it's about 350 gigawatt hours of heat have been delivered to the town since it was commissioned. So a few conclusions, lots of opportunities to do new things with ammonia. Uh, technical challenges, but that's what we do. As I showed you with the coloured bars and the energy use in the UK, the market for heat pumps is actually absolutely huge, uh, nine times the size of industrial refrigeration. The Draman model wouldn't work on its own in the UK, but the renewable heat incentive pays uh, the, what's called the spark gap, the difference between gas price and electricity price. Everybody thinks, so oh, Norway, the gas must be really cheap because they've got all that North Sea gas coming in, but they have no infrastructure. The North Sea gas is coming in right at the north end of Norway. It's a very long, thin, rocky country, and there's no national grid. So the users all down in the south don't have piped gas. It all comes in by tank trucks <coughs> stored in tanks on site, so it's very, very expensive. In the UK, it's the other way around. The gas is about a third the price of electricity. So we need RHI to make this work. Fortunately, we have RHI, so the calculations do stack up. And I've not talked about it at all, but one of the most um, appalling things about this project, from my perspective, is they take water out the river, they cool it down, they do something which I spend my life doing for a living, and it's quite difficult, and then they throw the water back in the river again. It's appalling, it's dreadful. Um, they've gone to all that effort and then they've thrown the, the cold water away. So free cooling is also possible. If you were to build your district heating centre next to um, a large office complex or a data centre or a, another industrial process that requires cooling, you could sell the heat to the town and you could also sell the cooling to the neighbours and uh, make double the money, basically. And finally, um, Slightly weird, um, we entered the project, actually have two um, Project Excellence Awards that they give. Uh, the Milk Garland Award for Refrigeration Projects and what they call the Comfort Cooling Award. So despite the fact that they throw the cooling away, Ashley in their wisdom decided to award Draman the 2017 Comfort Cooling Award. Um, I don't quite get it, but um, I'll find out in Las Vegas next month, or sorry, January. Um, 
quite what their thinking was. So that was very nice of them. So that's the presentation. Happy to take any questions or comments or observations. Anything you agree with, anything you disagree with, um, it's over to you. A techie question. Okay. Um, normally, ammonia is used for absorption, but in your case, it's vapor compression. Is it? This is vapor compression, the and I, I, I think that the normally is a bit wrong. All of most of what we do is ammonia refrigeration, and it's all vapor compression, so it's very common. And um, absorption used to be ammonia, but that has kind of, um, to a large extent, died away to a small extent, coming back again. But the vast majority of systems that I'm familiar with in the UK are vapor compression systems. And that's why the higher high, high pressure is sometimes. Yeah. How reliable is the ammonia supply? How reliable is the ammonia supply? As I said, it's, it's produced in enormous quantities for industrial uses, and only a tiny proportion is used for refrigeration, so it's very, very widely available and very cheap. It's very easy to get. Yes? Are the radiators that this feeds, are they special radiators for the temperature or are they just normal radiators? Um, in this case, I, I should say we're delivering at 90 degrees. The district loop, when they run the gas as well, they run up to 120 degrees. Oh, wow. um, they're supplying the commercial buildings in the centre of town and at the building end, it's just as, as you yeah, point out, or it's just a small heat exchanger yeah. in the basement. Right. So the rest of the building yeah. is, is absolutely normal. The Norwegians have a very, David Mackay was talking about sensible laws, and they have a very sensible law that anybody in the central business district, mm -hmm. by, by law, has to mm -hmm. connect to the loop. There's no law that says they have to buy the heat from the loop, but once they've connected, it's about a third of the price. So does it do any houses? Or any other heat? There, there's a few in, in um, combined um, occupancy buildings, yeah. but it's mainly the, the centre of town, mm -hmm. so it's mainly um, businesses. Anybody else? Just um, one more has mentioned in, in meetings that seen fire engineers have a heart attack, so maybe you want to uh, alleviate those fears in terms of the, the fallibility and the, the issues you're going uh -huh. to have. So. Um, well, all I can say is, from a refrigeration perspective, it's what we do for a living, as I said earlier, and we're very familiar with designing safe systems. Um, it actually has an excellent safety record and is as good as, if not better, than HFC refrigerants. So, it's all in the detail, really. If you were just to sort of throw it at the building and not care about it, you would get into trouble, no doubt about it. But if the system's properly designed and properly maintained, and my argument in that sense would be, you have to properly maintain it because you won't keep the, the energy efficiency and the reliability if you don't. And in this case, the, the, the business case is totally dependent on the efficiency and the reliability. You get better efficiency and reliability from ammonia but you'll only keep that if you maintain it properly. So having skilled staff to maintain it shouldn't be seen as a dreadful disadvantage. If you put one in and you don't maintain it, no matter what the refrigerant is, you will not deliver the financial performance necessary because it will get fouled up and dirty and, and less reliable <coughs> and, and be offline more often. So the safety issues are a large part of the, the total equation, but if you look at them on their own, they would lead you to a, a kind of false degree of comfort. Say, well, this R134A is a much safer refrigerant in quotes, so we'll use that instead, and you'd have a system that was less efficient and actually less reliable for a whole variety of, of reasons that we can go into, um, and just wouldn't deliver. So, you know, if, if you take the whole picture, as I said, <coughs> when NASA looked at the um, International Space Station, they picked ammonia as the refrigerant because it was the best choice. People have been using it as a refrigerant since 1857 because it's really good. And it's, it's not because they've got some kind of strange addiction to it or a sort of quirky mentality that says I'm going to do Everest the hard way. It's because it's really good. So that's why it's widely used in industrial refrigeration. Um, it's not used in domestic because the circumstances are not suitable. You know, the level of maintenance required wouldn't be available in the domestic situation, so it's rightly kept out of that. But in a, an application like this, which is an industrial plant by any description, is bigger than most of the systems that we build for the industrial market. It's um, the safety is not an issue. It's very, very good environmental 
uh, performance because it's um, zero ozone depletion potential and zero global warming potential and there isn't anything else that fits that bill. So really fantastic from that perspective. Um, and all of these reasons, efficiency, reliability, maintainability, ongoing lifetime performance, it's a good choice. So if you were to rule it out because it's flammable and toxic, you wouldn't really be doing yourself any favours. It's the difficulty, is exactly as you said, is getting that message across to people. How do you use it safely? But it would be wrong to say we can't use it safely because clearly we can use it safely. It's just going back to what you said about what everyone knows and yes. the same things that people... Well, that's the challenge. You're right. That's the challenge is getting beyond that. Much the system uh -huh. But if you were to go to the owner of that system and say to him, would you have another system? And if so, would it be ammonia or would it be something else? He'll tell you that the next one he builds will be an ammonia system. So he's, there's a user who's saying, I'll do it again. And that's really the, the, the strongest message. You can tell I'm a fan. <laughs> there's a question on the back. Yeah, uh, you touched on the difficulty of shifting a heat demand up to um, would you say district scale heat pumps lend themselves to thermal storage? Is that a uh... um, They do, and in the summertime, I was saying they have more of a challenge keeping it efficient in the summertime, but actually what they do is they allow the heat temperature to wander much more. So the, the supply temperature, they'll raise it all the way up to 90 and then switch the heat pump off and allow it to come all the way back in 70 and warm it up. And the, the um, I, f I forget the length of the loop here, but it's easily six miles of large diameter pipe work. There's a, a very long um, thermal lag in the system. So if you were linking it with um, an intermittent supply of, of energy, you could play tunes with the... Um, with the operating temperature, drop it low when electricity is in high demand elsewhere and raise it high when there's additional availability would be a very, very easy thing to do. We've already seen people doing that with their systems. The problems you mentioned in uh, the Arctic, are there any similar reduction in house volume in the Antarctic? It's a, it's a different issue because the Arctic is over water and the Antarctic is over land. And actually, the, the quantity of ice in the Antarctic this year was at a maximum level. It's difficult to understand, but again, you, you get all this uh, information off nsidc.org. But it, it has been going through bigger swings and fluctuations is the difference. So it is, you know, there's the same thing happening, but there's also the opposite thing happening. Not at the same time, but out of sync with it. So I think the variations are much bigger in the Antarctic. It's easier to see the trends in the Arctic ice because it's over water, so there's uh, um, less variability, if you like, is the easiest way to describe it. But essentially, <coughs> yes, the same thing is happening, but it's harder to see the trends. Any more questions? Oh, um, yes. Would, so, a lot of uh, district heat networks here are designed more for the sort of a bit lower uh, flow temperatures, and um, would that system work equally well at a sort of you know, 80 degree? No, it would work better. Right. Okay. Uh, 90 is a stretch. It's one of the reasons we use it is to prove that we can do it and we can maintain um, the, the performance levels at 90. But for every degree that you drop that flow temperature, now you need to be careful because the difference, the 9060, is also really important. If you drop the flow, you want to drop the return as well. But if you do that, every degree that you drop it gives you between 1.5 and 3% improvement in the efficiency. So basically, for the same electrical input, you'll have more heat to sell. So I would, I would far prefer you to see somebody doing a network that was 70-40, um, for example, than 60-90. Than um, and uh, everything else about it would be very, very similar. Once you drop down to a certain temperature, around about 75, you can also choose to do a single stage system, whereas the, the schematic that I showed was two stage. If it's single stage, the capital cost is cheaper, but the COP is a bit lower, but the COP is higher because you've dropped the temperature. So there's a kind of complicated trade-off to do. 
most people would go for the single stage because of the capital cost being lower. But if you wanted the most efficient heat pump, you could still do a two-stage one at 70 degree flow. Okay. One more question. Yeah. Last one. Um, ammonia and copper alloys are enemies now. What kind of metals did you use in your heat exchanges and operators and condensers? Uh, we used either carbon steel or stainless steel, which is normal for what we would do in, in the heat transfer. industrial refrigeration as well. Um, well, the, the evaporators are what's called spray chillers, so the ammonia is actually being sprayed over thinned tubes, so the heat transfer rate is exceptionally high mm -hmm. and the tube material becomes less important. But yeah, stainless steel is not a great choice for um, a heat transfer normally. But in this case, because of the, the spray effect, it counteracts that and you get good coverage. Okay. Hey, thank you very much, Andy. Um, fantastic presentation. Well, uh, um, fantastic turnout. Uh, I'm pleased that everybody's getting the uh, emails from HQ. Um, at the back of the room at the table, Assuming you've all handed in, you are assigned the register, there's a certificate for you at the end. Um, please take one. There's a, thick, there's a few of these which gives you a program of all the technical events that the region is holding. In fact, the next one that's in the schedule is scheduled for the 7th of December. And that's a membership evening as well. So for those that uh, are looking to either upgrade or those who are non-members would like to become a member, um, suggest perhaps um, attending that one. Okay. Uh, there is the annual dinner, which is a week on Friday. If anybody is attending as well, uh, fantastic event. Um, well attended. This year we're expecting circa 350 people there. So uh, look forward to seeing some of you there. Fantastic. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you.